Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on how the Israeli right changed the rules of the democratic game. This event is brought to you by the YNS Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA and is co-sponsored by the UCLA Center for Middle East Development. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. I'm delighted that so many people have joined us today and from so many countries around the world, including China, Russia, South Africa, Turkey, Egypt, Iraq, the UAE, Oman, Morocco, to name just a few. And I'm sure you'll all be very interested to hear from our speaker today, who I'm very happy to introduce, Dr. Gail Tashir. She is the Senior Lecturer in Political Science at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and is currently a visiting professor at the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. Dr. Tashir's research focuses on the crisis of legitimation of advanced democracies, party system change, political ideologies, and Israeli politics. She founded the Center for Top Government Officials and developed programs for newly elected mayors, civil servants, and senior leaders of Israel's public sector. And she is the author of several books, including Taking Ideology Seriously, published by Routledge in 2006. Her new book, Judocracy, the Netanyahu Era, will be published later this year by Sunni Press. And she'll be talking about that book today. During Dr. Talshir's presentation, I encourage you to send us your questions for her using the Q&A box, and I will put them to her in the questions to follow. Now, without any further ado, let me turn over to Dr. Talshir. Thank you. Uh, thank you Dov, for your uh, kind uh, introduction. So uh, here we are ready to go. So my talk to you today would be on the idea of judocracy, the Netanyahu era, but in particular on how Netanyahu shaped and reshaped the rules of the democratic game in Israel. And the first question I want to ask is, where should we begin this kind of uh, story? And one possible option is to start right in the beginning. And the beginning in our case uh, is uh, with Benny Tai. Uh, Benny Tai was an MIT graduate and he was living a comfortable life in Boston, working as a consultant at BCG with no intention of returning to Israel and with generous support from his rich uncles. These are the same uncles that are going to be the protagonist of case 3000 and the submarine issue uh, later, much later on in Israeli politics. He, had, uh, he did give occasional talks as part of Israeli advocates' efforts, but his first TV debate was when uh, Coletta Vital, uh, the consul general in New York, asked him to go on television to represent Israel against Professor Edward Said, one of the most eloquent advocates of the Palestinian cause. This first encounter, Ben Kaspit recounts in his biography, was a formative event. The first meeting between Ben Itai, none other than Benjamin Netanyahu, and the TV cameras. A new affair was kindled. This affair became a full-fledged relationship after the shocking death of Netanyahu's brother, Yoni, in the Entebbe raid. On July 4th, 1976, Ben Itai returned home also to his childhood name, Benjamin Netanyahu, brother of the Israeli hero Yoni, to establish the Yonatan Netanyahu Anti-Terror Institute. Netanyahu thus became Mr. Terror, an expert commentator against terrorism in the media, both in Israel and then back in Boston, where he was appointed to a political emissary uh, by a prominent Likud uh, MK, uh, Moshe Arendt. So one possible place to start our story is with Benitai and his two biggest achievements from very early on. One is becoming Mr. Terror, an expert on terrorism, and second, becoming an expert on TV presentation and how to basically control the media, which we'll get back to much, much later. But there's another place where we can start this discussion, and this is right at the very end. These very days, the last uh, few days, have been uh, carried on with a, a great uh, suspicion and maybe hope that the trials of Netanyahu are going to end up with a plea bargain between uh, Avichai Mendelblit, the Attorney General of Israel, uh, and Netanyahu himself. The most curious thing about this uh, plea bargain was the middlemen. Who did Netanyahu choose 
um, in order to try to convince the, the um, departing attorney general that this plea should go ahead. And this person was none other than uh, the former president of the uh, Supreme Court, uh, Ron Barak. Why is it so uh, um, important? Because Netanyahu over the last uh, three years was very, very um, busy in actually develop the uh, deep state kind of argument saying basically that it was the judicial system in Israel that tried to bring him down uh, being the choice of the people uh, into taking him off power by using this, uh, this uh, um, ability to control the Supreme Court. So how, why did Aaron Barak was actually convinced to go on with this plea bargain? Well, just a few days before Aaron Barak uh, went on behalf of Netanyahu to Mandelbrit, uh, this, uh, this, um, um, Index of Israeli Democracy was published. And what you can see here, and this was maybe uh, Barak's uh, greatest concern, is that the, um, that the trust of the public uh, institution coming from Israel declined sharply when you look at the Supreme Court. Let's see, let's look at it more closely. Uh, and you can see that if you look only on the blue line, the Jews uh, in Israel, you see that they begin with a very high trust uh, at the beginning of the 2000s, uh, around 80%, and there's a very, very sharp, sharp decline uh, in the support of the Israeli public of uh, the uh, Supreme Court. And it may be the exact reason why uh, Judge Barak thought that this is the right place to end the Netanyahu trials and to try uh, maybe to rehabilitate uh, the trust of the public uh, in uh, the Supreme Court. If you ask Ayala Chaked, that was the Minister of Justice uh, in under Netanyahu's uh, government 2015 to 19, she would tell you that the public standing of the Supreme Court has suffered in recent years from a sharp decline in public trust due to what? Due to its intervention in core issues of dispute and due to its decisions that conflict with Knesset laws and the will of the people. So the Supreme Court under the Justice Minister Shaked is actually in clash over the will of the people. But if you look and break down this kind of results, you see that the assertion that the trust of the Israelis in the Supreme Court is in sharp decline is not actually true. If you look it through uh, the self-identified political camps of the different uh, uh, um, aspirations of Israeli public, this is uh, the uh, Jewish uh, um, uh, poll. You see the left and center both has ve have very, very high support of the Supreme Court, much, much higher support than they have in other political institutions. But if you look at what the right wing in Israel uh, is answering to the same question of trust in the Supreme Court, you see the sharp decline from around 80% to around 38% only that have trust uh, in the Supreme Court. So while we are supposedly looking at the story of the Israeli public, we are actually looking at what happened to the right in Israel. And that brings me to the third uh, point of departure, which is actually my choice for this talk. Because rather than starting in the beginning or right at the very end, I suggest we start our talk uh, just in between. Um, those years in which Netanyahu has just lost the most crucial elections and brought the Likud, the ruling party in Israel, into its lowest ever. Uh, 12 mandates um, and was banned basically from politics. He did not resign. He wanted to come back to uh, the helm and to lead the Israeli public. How do you do that from such a low point? Well, Netanyahu traveled his beloved country, um, the US of America, and he told his very, very few associates that remained with him throughout the way the following things, and I, um, and I, uh, you can see it here. In the US, we know mainly about the East Coast and the West Coast. 
New York and San Francisco or Los Angeles, if you will. But between those two costs, there is a different America, a whole world. Those are the Republican strongholds. They don't believe the mainstream media. Take note, Fox News, said Netanyahu, is the new channel. It will break the monopoly. It will change America. The main idea of Netanyahu, if you look at Israeli politics over the last 20 years, is that you need to look on a different kind of Israel than we usually look to. And the way that you go and change Israeli politics is not through using um, the uh, public media that talks to the mainstream of the Tel Aviv uh, and educated uh, middle classes, but you establish your own channels of communicating with your own public. So the main idea that Netanyahu, maybe his uh, greatest, um, uh, greatest uh, uh, new thing that he brought to Israeli politics was actually the invention of what we can call the national camp. And with that, the new idea of what the Jewish people uh, was actually all about. So when we embark upon our uh, journey to, uh, to uh, try to understand judocracy, we have three components, the leader, the, gov the governance or the ruling uh, of the laws and the people. And the way I want to uh, proceed with my talk is to choose one, uh, one point to just demonstrate because uh, our time is very uh, short. One point of each of these um, 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 ideas, the people, popular democracy and the leader to try to give you some idea about how Netanyahu actually changed both uh, the national camp and Israeli uh, democracy at large. So the natural choice when you come to talk about the people is the nation state uh, basic law. But since the next uh, Nazarian uh, talk is going to be about uh, the nation state uh, basic law and other issues, I chose to uh, try to convey to you some of the main ideas about the new people that uh, Netanyahu and his uh, ministers uh, have uh, conveyed in Israel through the 70th anniversary ceremony uh, and the national narrative that it reaches. So my choice was actually to give you a glimpse of the debate between Miri Regev, one of the loyalist uh, um, um, Netanyahu uh, ministers. She was appointed to the Minister of Culture and a famous uh, author that you probably know called Meir Shalev. And Miri Regev says about Meir Shalev the following. While all of his protagonists are Ashkenaz, Shalev does not write about Mizrahim, that means uh, Jews that came from uh, Mediterranean countries, thus obliterating them from the national codex. So that was the claim of Miri Regev uh, against uh, um, Meir Shalev, one of the most prominent authors in Israeli literature. And Shalev responds, there were no Mizrahi Jews among the founders of Nahalal. Do you want me to make some up? There weren't any, I'm sorry. An author writes within the landscape of their birthplace. I am a free human being. I am a free artist. I will not provide literature services or hand my pen over to anyone. Regev responds. Meir Shalev has some nerve. The Mizrahi weren't part of his childhood landscape. What is he talking about? He grew up in Jezreel Valley. What about the Fula, Migdala, Emek, Beit Sheyan? The immigrants who made Aliyah in the 50s weren't part of the setting of his uh, life, really? And Shalem answers, well, the book that Miri Regev was referring to was a Russian novel, and it's set in the period of the second Aliyah, a time when there were indeed no developmental development towns uh, as the waves of immigration from North Africa became only in the 1950s. The main point that Miri Regev is trying to make is how do we actually um, select what the national narrative is all about. And she claims that Shalev and others are a tiny elite that sees the history of Israel from their own perspective. 
not only the developmental uh, uh, towns that she cares about, but also, and maybe even more importantly so, if you look at the uh, electorate of the Likud, the settlements in Judea and Samaria, um, and the occupied lands of 1967. And Miri Regev says, it is not just the story of the immigrants from North Africa that hasn't been told, but also the story of the settlers in the West Bank. The early Israeli settlements of the 1970s, people had settled there in order to protect my home, and yet their story is not considered part of our ethos. So this is exactly what Regev, uh, Netanyahu's loyalist uh, culture minister, was trying to set right. And one special place where she wanted to do that was the 17th anniversary uh, independence ceremony uh, in 2018 that she was responsible for. So a lot of the row that you came about it when you were in Israel was about how long Netanyahu is going to uh, uh, give his speech at the ceremony and who is going to be invited and who is in charge. But I want you just um, um, remark on two issues in the constructions of this uh, 17th anniversary ceremony. The first is what Miri Regev decided to do according to uh, her own uh, admission <coughs> is to rebalance the narrative of the nation. So she said that the Holocaust got enough attention in other ceremonies and she is going to actually play much harder on other crises of the Jewish um, people. So the, in response to Meir Shalev, the person that conducts the ceremony comes from Migdala Emek, one of the developmental towns that are quite near the Halan. He has a very big uh, kippah on his uh, head and he starts uh, with, uh, of course, um, Mount Sinai and the Jewish people as a religious people. Throughout the ceremony, there are several mentions of uh, the uh, first temple and the second temple destructions. And the way that Miri Regev does treat the Holocaust, she was uh, um, saying that she cracked the Holocaust and gave the Holocaust one minute out of this uh, almost uh, 70 minutes ceremony. And the way she cracked it was the picture you see here, uh, the kids uh, with, um, um, with the uh, yellow uh, uh, badges and um, the uh, sounds of a uh, train uh, in the distance. Now, what's crucial here that after she presented this uh, Holocaust episode, she turned on to uh, the pioneers. Do you see uh, the picture down here? And she's telling the story in this very interesting way, thus responding to Shalem. Yaakov Cohen, the author, the uh, orator, announces pioneers, pioneers in Jerusalem, pioneers in Tel Aviv, pioneers in Degania and in Dimona, in Petah Tikva, Kiryat Shmona, Kineret, Yerucham, pioneers in Hadera, Gedera, Kfar Saba, Hebron, Tel Chai, Migdal Emek, pioneers in Halal, in Arad, Beit El, Nitzana, pioneers in Rishon Lezion, pioneers in, in Amichai, pioneers. So the national story is told differently. Pioneers are not just the Zionist uh, um, uh, um, people that came in the early 20th century and uh, tried to uh, establish, to buy land and to establish uh, uh, Jewish settlements before the state was established. But actually, if you look at the list of this kind of uh, cities that she puts forward, you see that the big stress is, of course, on developmental towns, but also on the settlements. So Amichai and uh, Hebron and other such uh, uh, settlements are part of and parcel of her idea of who are the pioneers and from that perspective, who are the real Zionists of Israel today. Um, so that was the first um, glimpse into the idea of reshaping the narrative, the national narrative, and look and put
putting the stress on both Mizrahi uh, um, periphery uh, Jews and on the settlers as part of the national ceremonies under the uh, idea of uh, Miri Regev, Netanyahu's loyalist uh, culture minister. But I want to move over to the second issue of what kind of Israeli democracy did Netanyahu's government actually uh, looked forward to. And maybe one of the crucial issues here is what we call the overriding clause. The idea of the overriding clause is how to limit from the government's, Netanyahu's government perspective, how to limit the Supreme Court's prerogative to rule unconstitutional laws co that contradicts human rights and the nature of Israel as Jewish and democratic. And this is maybe the most bitter um, argument that going on today between the left and the right uh, in Israel, but the boundaries between the left and right are rapidly changing. My main argument to you today is when you look at the way that the right wing in Israel changed the democracy, you have to understand that Netanyahu is a very, very late comer into the debate between the Supreme Court and the government. In fact, he only joined this kind of um, arguments when his trial uh, began. But if you look at the deep uh, roots, the deep social roots of the resentments towards the Supreme Court, the one that we saw before that shaped the idea of the right wing in Israel so much so that they don't have uh, a trust in this um, uh, in an independent uh, uh, court in Israel, the uh, people that actually behind the idea that the, that the Supreme Court is a problem can be divided into four or five different groups with very, very long roots. The first of them you can see uh, in the picture uh, are the ultra-Orthodox. The ultra-Orthodox have a very long uh, standing debate with the Supreme Court over the idea of the draft uh, exemptions. And the ultra-Orthodox basically defy the idea of equality, equality before the law, because of this main issue of drafting to the IDF. The first override clause that was submitted to the Knesset was in 1998 by Gaffney, the head of one of the ultra-Orthodox parties in Israel. So they have a long beef with the Israeli court. The second very dominant group that we can talk about that resent uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruling are the settlements, the settlers in Judea and Samaria. And their main uh, beef with the Supreme Court is that if it is the case that it is the government, the policy government uh, to uh, actually establish uh, the uh, settlements uh, in the occupied territories, then they say the courts should not interfere in this kind of policies because that makes the courts political and that makes the government uh, not uh, sovereign it's in its uh, decisions. So the second very dominant group against the Supreme Court are the settlers. The third group, which is younger, it's about 20 years uh, now that they are very active, are these groups that work against the, what they call the illegal infiltrators, um, the refugees and other uh, people that uh, came to Israel illegally seeking for either refuge or work. So this is a third very dominant group that resists the, the humanistic ruling of the Supreme Court. And the fourth group, which is very, very interesting, uh, what uh, I'm going to call the counter-revolution uh, um, um, Zionist that take Awan uh, Barak's constitutional revolution, meaning the idea that Israel, Israeli court can actually rule unconstitutional laws that conflict with uh, human rights, they take this as the pivot to the changing of the Israeli system and what they want to do and what they have effectively did in many, many different ways during Netanyahu's regime is actually to try to resettle the basic laws and the nation state the basic law is such great example of how to change the uh, constitutional composition of Israeli politics. So Netanyahu standing, as you see here at the beginning of his trial, 
is a latecomer to these different uh, right-wing groups that have a very, very long struggle against the uh, Supreme Court and the independency of the courts uh, in Israel. And when Netanyahu is standing here and all his ministers try to uh, project uh, loyalty to him, and he says that it is the judicial system that actually concocted uh, uh, the trial to get him off power and to act against the people of Israel, then you see that he's tapping on a very long tradition in of the Israeli right. Now, the final, uh, um, the final uh, analysis that I wanted to give you was about how Netanyahu uh, uh, actually be, tried to control the news. And there are seven very, very different strategies of how he used, but you know a lot of them because you're probably following Netanyahu's trial. Netanyahu's trial are about one such, uh, one or two such manifestations of his attempts to uh, control uh, the media. So you can see the different strategies that he used. Uh, and there's a big uh, analysis, a much uh, de more developed analysis uh, in uh, this uh, forthcoming book. But I want to wrap up my talk by uh, trying to bring these uh, three issues together and to um, try to remind you of uh, Netanyahu's speech back in January 28, uh, at Washington, standing side by side with uh, President Trump. And as you recall, Netanyahu's speech, which was a very long speech uh, to the dismay of uh, the American president, opened uh, uh, his argument in the following way. He says, for too long, far too long, the very heart of the land of Israel were our patriarchs prayed, our prophets preached, and our kings ruled has been outrageously branded as illegally occupied territory. Well, today, Mr. President, you are puncturing this big lie. You are recognizing Israel's sovereignty over all the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, large and small alike. The three angles that we talked about actually come together in how Netanyahu, and today we know that it was not how Trump himself uh, saw the achievement uh, of this uh, ceremony, uh, but how Netanyahu saw the kind of mission that he was leading. He was actually building a new way of looking at Israel as uh, a Jewish people. If you look at the kind of uh, uh, issues that uh, he talks about in this speech, he doesn't talk strategy, he doesn't talk security, he speaks of uh, Israel, biblic the biblical promise to the Israeli people uh, by uh, God the Almighty himself, and the way that it was transformed through the patriarchs and the prophets and the kings that ruled uh, all of Israel from his uh, perspective, uh, and that the president of uh, the United States are actually said to recognize uh, the Jewish um, um, natural right to this uh, land. So the kind of Israel that we see under Netanyahu developing is one which actually stresses the idea that the Israeli people is religious-based kind of people, that the kind of narrative that it wants to generate is very different than the Jewish and democratic kind of narrative that we um, uh, usually think about Israel if you look uh, from the uh, independence declaration uh, later on. And the kind of idea of democracy is actually the democracy of the majority, and the majority is the majority of the Jews not the majority uh, of uh, all the citizens of Israel. And that was the way for Netanyahu both to set aside the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as something which is uh, almost trivial in the uh, international arena, but also to reframe the Israeli public discourse on the ideas of this new idea of a national camp, national camp, which is much more Jewish um, and much more religious oriented than the both Jewish and democratic ideas that uh, dominated Israeli public uh, life for uh, the last uh, 70 years. So I'm very, very uh, um, interested to hear your uh, comments and uh, discussions and questions. And uh, let me uh, get uh, back to Dov, please. 
Thank you, Dr. Taoshir, for that fascinating presentation. Um, before we uh, get our Q&A underway, I just want to remind everybody in the audience to send us in your questions, and I will uh, try and put some of them to uh, Dr. Taoshir. Um, uh, let me begin, first of all, um, with a really big question about Netanyahu, and it's a question I think that has um, preoccupied many scholars and analysts um, for, for many years about Netanyahu and, and divided opinion. And that is, is he an ideologue? Is Netanyahu motivated by ideology? Does he have a kind of core set of ideological convictions um, as do others on the Israeli right? Or is he rather really an opportunist? Somebody who, you know, as, for example, the Israeli right decided to uh, challenge the Supreme Court, so Netanyahu follows, that he doesn't really lead so much as kind of detect which way the winds are blowing and, and moves in that direction. So from your perspective, do you think of him as, a, as an ideologue or as a pragmatic or kind of opportunistic uh, leader? Um, I think Netanyahu is an ideologue, but I think his ideology transformed over the years. I think... Uh, over uh, his first uh, um, rule as a prime minister, and especially over his uh, rule as a minister of finance uh, under uh, Sharon's government, his main ideology was a neoliberal kind of ideology. His main transformations of the Israeli society uh, was uh, his economic outlook as a neoliberal. But I think if you look uh, to uh, the uh, later years, as of uh, 2015, definitely, then you see that Netanyahu uh, have really uh, caught onto two fundamental uh, uh, trends, ideological trends that we see all over the world and especially with the Trump administration. One is uh, neoconservatism, which means going back to the idea of religion and tradition uh, and a much more uh, conservative way of looking at um, society. But in Israel, there is no such tradition. So Netanyahu and uh, his uh, major uh, uh, ministers had to reinvent a tradition of conservatism, which was not part, not even of the Likud uh, party because the Likud party uh, originally uh, was the Herut party, which is the Liberty party. And Gachal, the, uh, for, the former uh, name of uh, the Likud, is the bloc of the liberals and uh, the Herut party. So Netanyahu actually invented neoconservative ideology as a prime uh, uh, tradition in Israeli politics. Why? Because, and this is where I tap into your idea that maybe he is an opportunist, the biggest question for Netanyahu is how to gain support and rule the country. And the way he did that is to invent uh, his idea of the national camp. And it goes back to um, Finkelstein's uh, um, a poll conducted for Netanyahu in 96, that he asked a very simple question, are you for, uh, first and foremost a Jew? or an Israeli. And when the majority of Israelis said they are first and foremost Jews, Netanyahu took Jewishness to be the formative idea of the Jewish people and constructed his neoconservative ideology around this notion. The second big idea that Netanyahu and Trump, but also Orban and others bring to the fore is the idea that the right-wing um, leader does not have to address the public at large or the public interest, what he needs to do is to uh, uh, form bonds with his own uh, uh, with his own electorate and with his own uh, base of support. And this is what Netanyahu did best. He invented a new story that uh, was very easy to relate for those people uh, that uh, bought into the idea of uh, the poor uh, uh, Jewish uh, kind of uh, communities and much less resonated with the educated the middle classes that actually support, um, uh, uh, have much more control over media and uh, culture and other issues uh, in Israel. So he knew how to play with ideas, but in the end, if you look uh, throughout his, uh, his uh, uh, power, the, um, his reign in power, then you can say that he has developed a neoconservative uh, kind of ideology, which uh, puts the leader 
and the people at the uh, uh, the main frame and tries to actually goes against um, a lot of the intermediating balancing kind of institutions that democracies usually are very proud uh, of having. So um, thank you for that. I mean, in many ways, it's interesting to think that Netanyahu's ideology is an ideology um, that was born in the US context of, of neoconservatives in many ways is more indebted to uh, Milton Friedman uh, and other neoconservative thinkers and, um, than perhaps the kind of right-wing ideological tradition in Israel. Um, maybe his, more, um, his, his ideological father then maybe Friedman or, or Barry Goldwater or Nixon rather than his own father, Ben Zion Netanyahu, who's often you know, held up as the, as the great ideological influence in Netanyahu. Um, in terms of this approach of, of, of setting himself up as the kind of leader with this um, direct connection to the masses and trying to circumvent these mediating institutions like the Knesset, um, does that mean, in your view, that we should think of Netanyahu really as an authoritarian populist in the way that scholars have described somebody like Trump, for example, or uh, Modi in, 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 in India, that, that really, um, while he played within the rules of the democratic game, he's, he's essentially is a populist. And um, this, this is, um, and, and that really he is in, should be put in that same category as other kind of illiberal populists. Um. I think uh, this is uh, this is the case with uh, Netanyahu, but I think it's different to look at populists that come from within uh, democracies and maybe even liberal democracies uh, to populists that uh, that are part of a less uh, of anti-liberal uh, uh, democracies uh, in the first place. So I think what is most fascinating about Netanyahu and Netanyahu's turn, basically, is the way that he turned the Likud party and the right wing in Israel from being the liberal party, basically, uh, to being the anti-liberal party. And you can see that symbolically uh, by the uh, uh, slogan that uh, he chose for the 2013 elections. Uh, Israel, the, the major uh, slogan about Israel is uh, Israel uh, is Jewish and democratic. The 2013 uh, slogan was Israel, Jewish and strong. So uh, he uh, completely obliterated the idea of democracy uh, and uh, put instead of it uh, the ideas of uh, nationalism and populism. And I think there are two major um, ideas about that. The first is the idea, and this is very important for populists at large, the idea that elections are like the sanctuary of the will of the people. Now, you know, Netanyahu did not win the last four rounds of elections, but it was not something uh, uh, that bothered him when he uh, continues to argue that he is the choice of the people. So we see with other populist leaders, the idea that there is the leader and there is the people and everything in between uh, is looked at upon as a distraction of, um, of uh, politics. And what Netanyahu specialized uh, in was actually to say that uh, the judges and the uh, academic elites and the uh, uh, journalists, et cetera, are not elected and therefore are not democratic. And he is the only democratic uh, representative of uh, the Jewish people, not even the Israelis, but uh, the Jewish uh, people at large. So this is something that we know uh, very well from other populist uh, leaders. I think uh, what we talked about before, neoliberal uh, um, uh, Netanyahu took liberalism away from political liberalism uh, onto the uh, economic uh, stage. And I think this is how liberalism actually evaporated from being uh, the, uh, the uh, basic uh, idea uh, of the right. And I think from my perspective, this is the biggest challenge of Israeli politics uh, to bring back uh, the uh, public uh, notion of being liberal, a liberal democracy, which accommodates uh, a nation state. But I think Netanyahu was very, very uh, uh, pervasive in trying to say that the liberals, not only they're uh, not right wing, but they're also almost uh, delegitimized because of the kind of uh, the patriotism and the loyalty that he uh, wanted to uh, to um, uh, have as you know 
the leader that uh, he has uh, seen himself to be. I mean, it, it is ironic in your describing Netanyahu's kind of uh, campaign against the liberal elite in Israel, whether in the media or in the judiciary, that he himself is the scion of this of, of an elite. I mean, he's, uh, you know, as you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation, this is somebody who was raised partly in the United States, academic background, uh, Ashkenazi, um, MIT educated. Um, what accounts you, do you think for the fact that despite his own background and pedigree, if you like, he was embraced, he is embraced by so many people for this anti-elitism, despite the fact he is himself a member of this elite in many ways, but uh, particularly for um, Mizrahim in Israel, you know, his um, attacks have resonated and they've embraced him. What, what, how do you account for the fact that Many, you know, working class people, uh, many Mizrahim in Israel, others have seen Netanyahu, have, have embraced him as their, as King Bibi, you know, despite the fact that he himself is a member, is, is come, comes from really this elite background. Uh, I think it is all about the narrative and the narrative is more important than the biography of the person. So uh, the way that Netanyahu shares the same narrative with those uh, Mizrahi developmental town, uh, uh, um, uh, poorer uh, uh, strata in Israel is uh, their resentment against the elites, which we know very well from other uh, populist uh, kind of uh, uh, leaders, but I think that the way that he framed it, and especially the deep state kind of argument that we've been hearing from Netanyahu before the uh, Trump uh, uh, era even, uh, is the idea that uh, Labour and Mapai were, were actually um, manipulating um, the uh, Mizrahi Jews. Not only that, but he tapped into the idea that the uh, Zionist revolution was actually anti-religious revolution. In many ways, Zionism transformed Judaism as a religion to nationalism. And uh, this is exactly what alienated many, many of the Mizrahi Jews that uh, came, um, uh, made Aliyah, what we call, to Israel on basing uh, their uh, uh, tradition and their religious aspirations. And they came to a very secular, in many ways, anti-religious sort of a state. And the minute that Netanyahu, begging before him, but also Netanyahu, tapped into the idea that Judaism is first and foremost, and, uh, uh, foremost a religion, then he brought a different kind of narrative that connected him uh, to the people that saw him as the hero because in a way they gave he gave legitimacy to their own self-perceptive uh, uh, self-idea of Jewishness being about religion and not just about a secular democratic state. So even though he is not, uh, 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 he, he does not maybe even share this very idea, um, then you can see any, any picture of the uh, AIDS and the people around it. And yeah, we'll see the majority of them have kippa on and they're religious people. You see the connection between the settlers uh, and their uh, uh, leadership and the people that work around Netanyahu. So I think changing the narrative towards a much more religious oriented kind of uh, idea of nationalism gave both proud, uh, pride to uh, the Mizrahis and to the religious uh, people and also juxtaposed them uh, against the uh, secular elites uh, that were actually uh, very anti-religious in their whole uh, perspective about uh, Zionism. So I wonder, um, I mean, in, in kind of juxtaposing the people defined in kind of religious or ethnic religious terms mm -hmm. uh, against the elite, and setting himself up as the uh, representative of this of the people, um, and often you know railing against not just the elite but also leftists particularly. Um, to what extent do you think Netanyahu bears responsibility? This is a question that came in from a member of the audience. Uh, to what extent does he bear responsibility for the growing polarization 
in Israel between left and right that we see um, that's taken place over the last few years. I mean, we've seen certainly that happen in the United States and American politics. And for that, many people have said, you know, President Trump was a major, uh, maybe not the sole cause, but certainly really exacerbated uh, political polarization in Israel. Do you think it's fair to blame Netanyahu for doing that in, in Israel? Absolutely. Netanyahu is the author of polarization uh, in Israel uh, um, uh, politics over the last uh, 10 uh, years. And the main reasons are basically uh, about uh, electoral survival. So the framing, uh, the what Netanyahu did to not only the left, but the left and the center and cer certainly the Arab uh, Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel, is a process of delegitimation because it's one, say to, one thing to say I'm a political rival. We have different views about uh, economics or about uh, um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's quite another thing to say that your views are illegitimate. That uh, the kind of delegitimation process that Netanyahu led, he actually used uh, the Arabs uh, in Israel uh, to form this kind of affinity between the Arabs and the left to delegitimize the left. But what was curious about Netanyahu, that it was not just the Arabs and the left that were delegitimized, but also basically everyone who is a liberal in Israel. And as we said before, the majority of liberals, you can find them on the right, not just on the left. So every leader and every uh, uh, political person that came from the right and said that he was against Netanyahu's policies or Netanyahu's views was immediately uh, uh, portrayed as a danger uh, to the uh, patriotic uh, national uh, Jewish uh, uh, majority that Netanyahu has led. And there was a process of delegitimation. Uh, so it was both a personal thing about Netanyahu that didn't want rivals from within his own uh, uh, political camp and his way of actually uh, delegitimizing everyone who is not loyalist to him personally and to his uh, ideas. So uh, yes, definitely, I think Netanyahu is responsible for a lot of the polarization uh, in Israeli politics today, but as I try to show in my talk, there are deeper currents uh, that are much more uh, radical in their ideology than Netanyahu himself, who did it uh, from political reasons and much, much less uh, on a more uh, basic idea of uh, the kind of Israel that he wants uh, to see. So um, I wanna um, turn to, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, uh, the the role of Aaron Barak, the former um, Chief Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court, the, the person held responsible for the kind of constitutional revolution in Israel. And here he is, this person who's an icon for Israeli liberals, uh, mm -hmm. taking on this very surprising role in trying to get a plea deal with Netanyahu. Um, in his own explanation, Barak's explanation of why he, he took this, mm -hmm. he said, uh, that he credits Netanyahu with trying to um, maintain the Supreme Court's authority and actually push back against some of these override bills. Do you think that's correct? I mean, do you think that Barak's um, view that Netanyahu was a supporter or at least or was a protector of the Supreme Court was correct? Or is it maybe Netanyahu um, that was the earlier Netanyahu, maybe the Netanyahu of the late 90s and not in his later years. Um, you know, I was talking about the uh, overriding the clause and um, it was very imminent under Netanyahu's government, but it was never legislated. The reason why it was not legislated was because of Netanyahu. So in many ways, I think it is fair to say that uh, that the biggest uh, um, um, idea that Netanyahu is the protector of the courts came from the right itself, uh, both the settlers and the uh, ultra orthodox uh, and uh, the uh, people that uh, that are uh, against the uh, constitutional revolution was actually uh, criticizing Netanyahu for sheltering 
uh, the judicial system, the reasons for Netanyahu to do it were much more ambivalent than they may think. So one reason why Netanyahu supported the independence of the courts was because this was the main argument of Israel vis-a-vis -vis The Hague and other international bodies that we have uh, our own independent courts, and that was the kind of way to uh, buff, uh, to um, set aside uh, such international arguments for this is one thing. The other thing is uh, that uh, Barack President, uh, that uh, Chief Justice uh, Barack and Netanyahu had a very, very long uh, relationship uh, uh, before that. And, uh, and uh, I think that uh, Netanyahu's destructive uh, way of trying to uh, impinge upon the whole judicial system in Israel, um, the kind of uh, um, um, narrative that he produced are very detrimental. And I think that the Barak uh, wanted to actually put an end to it. Uh, so his idea was that if Netanyahu pleads guilty, then that settles because that shows basically that Netanyahu uh, was not persecuted uh, un, uh, legally by the courts, et cetera, and, and we can start, uh, begin the reconstruction. Uh, but uh, I do not believe that Netanyahu, over the last three years, Netanyahu uh, was the most uh, destructive force against the Supreme Court and other uh, uh, judicial uh, uh, entities in Israel. Uh, and therefore, I think that Barack's uh, idea is true up to the last uh, three years. Uh, and uh, you can see that from the criti criticism that comes from the extreme right and the extreme uh, left in Israel against Barack and against, and against uh, the plea bargain. Uh, in short, Netanyahu was a defender of the courts up until uh, uh, three, four years ago, but for his own purposes, over the last three years, he did uh, very uh, uh, detrimental damage to the courts uh, in Israel. In terms of where things stand now and looking into the future, you've mentioned the plea agreement, which doesn't look like it's going to happen. Uh, and the reason, at least in the short term, is that Netanyahu has uh, rejected this demand to accept moral turpitude and a span that would come uh, for at least banning him for seven years from Israeli politics. Um, do you think he'll make a comeback? I mean, this is the big question today. He's still the leader of the Likud. Uh, he's uh, still, the Likud is still the largest party in the Knesset. Um, is, his, is the Netanyahu era truly over? in your view, or do you think, um, you know, he is biding his time and will be able to uh, make a comeback in the, in the, in the near term? Um, Netanyahu is not going to give up uh, on uh, power. Uh, we saw that because uh, he led Israel into four uh, repeating uh, uh, cycles of elections that he, it was clear that he has no uh, real chance of becoming a uh, uh, Prime Minister, and still this is what uh, he did because he wanted to cling on uh, to power. Um, so the kind, there are three different uh, ways to uh, imagine uh, where Netanyahu can go from here. The first is that he will take the plea um, and uh, would uh, live a life of a, a renowned uh, um, politician that can advise uh, uh, international uh, bodies um, and enjoy uh, the good life. So th this is one tempting uh, scenario that uh, he has. The second is that this government uh, is so uh, um, uh, is way too pluralistic to actually last uh, its term, and therefore it's going to uh, uh, fall down. And Netanyahu does not want to give up power uh, and to uh, miss the opportunity to lead the Likud again into what he thinks is going to be a great uh, victory. So this is the uh, second uh, scenario. And the third scenario uh, is that, um, you know, I, I, uh, I remind you that the person that wanted the plea bargain was Netanyahu himself. So you truly uh, mentioned that it was he who said uh, no for now, but the reason why he said no was because uh, Mandelblit uh, told him that uh, it was not going to happen within this uh, week that Mandelblit is still uh, the attorney general. And I think Netanyahu understands because all these lawyers advised him that it would be much, much 
uh, um, uh, more secure to know what the deal is, what the plea bargain uh, uh, is, uh, and then to place uh, his chance with the uh, judi uh, with the judges. So I think, the sh in short, the uh, the risk is as follows: if he waits, he has three or four more years before this um, trial runs its course, and during this time, he can go get back into power. Uh, the other way is to take the plea bargain and to be a free man uh, to do what he wants uh, to do out there in the world. Both uh, options are the options that Netanyahu considers. Uh, I think um, from Israeli perspective, you hear both uh, these voices, one that says the trial must go on because uh, he needs to be trialed in uh, the court of justice uh, and uh, justice uh, needs to be uh, shown. The other side is saying, Take a plea bargain, uh, take a leave, uh, and Israel can try to uh, reconstruct uh, its uh, democracy uh, in the uh, in the years uh, to come. So, what Netanyahu is going to do, uh, you know, it's your guess as good as uh, mine. But uh, I think that Netanyahu, as we know, he will not give up on power and will definitely try to make a comeback. So Netanyahu's era is not yet uh, truly finished. And I think the main idea that I tried to convey is that he made such structural changes into the Israeli democracy that even when the man himself is gone from Israeli politics, uh, the changes that his government led are going to stay. And this is what Israel has to deal with uh, in the years to come. So it, it certainly seems that Netanyahu is not going to uh, voluntarily uh, relinquish the prospect of returning to power. But I wonder whether Likud will um, continue to stand by him. I mean, within when there was this, uh, the, the real prospect in the last couple of weeks that he may accept this plea agreement, we already saw um, very quickly, you know, potential um, uh, successes. Uh, you know, maneuvering and, and, and beginning to position themselves to, to uh, take over the Likud. Um, do you think the Likud party is going to stand by Netanyahu? Maybe I should put it another way. Will Netanyahu continue to be able to control Likud uh, as he's done so successfully for so long to really turn it into a, a vehicle for himself? Uh, the paradox is the following. The minute that Netanyahu steps down, um, the Likud does not even need to go into a new elections. It can just use its power in this Knesset and form a different kind of uh, right-wing government as uh, the right uh, always uh, uh, wanted to do. So Netanyahu is the main and the only obstacle uh, uh, that stands in uh, uh, the way of a right-wing government in Israel without even a need to go to elections. We see that Netanyahu does not shy away and does not say, okay, I'm going to step down and let uh, someone else lead. This is what we know about Netanyahu for many years. And we know that nobody within the Likud had the, um, uh, the guts to actually stand up to Netanyahu. Those who did, like Kahlon and Saar, and, uh, uh, ended up uh, outside of uh, the Likud. Uh, so even though it would have been the political rational thing to do, um, I, I don't see the people from within the Likud uh, actually mastering this kind of courage against uh, the uh, leader that they were loyal to for so uh, many years. I think they're waiting either for a plea bargain uh, or uh, other way that Netanyahu is actually going to uh, depart on, on his own. But I, of course, agree with you that the kind of tensions that we see coming from within the Likud symbolize the kind of struggle that uh, are already happening uh, underneath the ground and are going to erupt uh, the minute that uh, uh, there is a change uh, in this uh, situation. And the big question is whether the next uh, leader of the Likud is going to go back to being a liberal national or whether they're going to remain with this neoconservative populist, uh, uh, more extremist kind of ideology. I think this is uh, the big uh, question uh, to uh, ask about the Likud in the days after Netanyahu, but I don't see it uh, happening before he takes a leave. Thank you. So as uh, just a final uh, quick question then uh, for a very quick response, because we, uh, we're out of time, um, but beyond the Likud itself, I'm speaking more broadly about the Israeli right, 
who do you see, if anyone, as Netanyahu's kind of likely successor as leader of the Israeli right? Is it Naftali Bennett? Is it Ayala Shaked? Is it Miri Regev? Um, is there anyone you see as Nitin, as kind of Netanyahu is likely successful in terms of seeing the vision that Netanyahu has, sharing his views, sharing his approaches, uh, who would be the most likely to kind of become the next leader of the Israeli right in the way that Netanyahu has been for so long? Um, I think if you look back uh, to see who was the successor of uh, Begin, that, and then you must admit that Shomir was unlikely um, um, Israeli leader. Uh, and I think that uh, points us to the idea that the person that might be able to do it is the one that has more reson resonance with controlling uh, the Likud uh, party mechanisms. Um, so that means that the big struggle today is who is going to control, who is going to become uh, the, uh, um, um, the temporal uh, leader of the Likud uh, after Netanyahu departs and stuff like that, because it is going to boil down to who controls the mechanisms. And therefore people like uh, Nir Barkat that have a lot of uh, support uh, in the uh, larger uh, right-wing uh, camp maybe, and definitely uh, uh, on the center um, has no uh, ability to control the mechanisms of the Likud, which means that Israel Katz and Chaim Katz and people like that have much more um, 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 at least uh, initial advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis controlling the Likud. Uh, to answer your question, uh, I think all of those that you mentioned and also Edelstein and Anegbi and the others are going to be contesting uh, as uh, the leaders of the right wing. Uh, I think that they do not necessarily share Netanyahu's views on uh, many issues, but they had to uh, comply with these uh, ideas. Um, and I think uh, what we're going to be to possibly see is a new kind of uh, uh, rearranging uh, the forces in the Israeli party system and uh, these uh, different kind of actors like Saar and Bennett and Shaked are trying are going to try to find a new formulation that will give them uh, the uh, uh, head start of the next ruling party of Israel, it might not be the case that it's going to come from the right. It might as well uh, come from the center or the center left because uh, there might be um, uh, a breakdown of the national camp after uh, Netanyahu's time. Well, this has been a really fascinating conversation. I could continue it for another hour, but unfortunately we are out of time. So thank you, uh, Dr. Talshir, for your presentation, for your, for your answers. Really, really interesting. I want to thank all the uh, audience for joining us from all over the world. Um, and uh, I want to invite you all to attend our next webinar, which will be happening on Wednesday, February the 16th, when Dr. Joseph Zaira, who is a professor of economics at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, will give a talk on the topic of his new book titled The Israeli Economy, A Story of Success and Costs. So I hope you will join us on February the 16th. I want to thank again, Dr. Tal Shear. Uh, this webinar will be available uh, for future viewing on our website. So I encourage you to spread the word and I hope to see you all again in the future. Thanks again and goodbye.